Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Crash Course Economics. Uh, it's great to see so many uh, attendees. Um, and welcome back for those who've witnessed our series before the summer. So uh, I'd like you to invite you to introduce yourself in the chat. Maybe just say your name, where you're based, and why you work. So my name is Sarah. I am the coordinator of the Alternative Trade Coalition at the Transnational Institute. And my today's co-host is Rodrigo Fernandez, who's a researcher Hello. at SOMO. And then we have behind the scenes Jeremy uh, Krollsmith, who's an independent web developer, Kees Hudig from Global Info, and Jenny Pannebecker, also from SOMO, who are working very hard behind the scenes to make these uh, webinars a great success. And who are we as a collective? Well, we're a collective of engaged activists and experts from a number of organizations. And uh, we united at the start of the corona crisis because we wanted to make understandable what is happening. Uh, also say something about the new problems that arise and put forward ideas uh, and solutions of how to solve these problems. Now, Crash Course is a platform, um, an online platform, which is designed to open up the debate on how we can move out of the current crisis and also make the necessary steps towards achieving social, economic and ecological justice. Uh, in order to do so, we're inviting global experts from all over the world uh, to break down complex issues and make them accessible to you all. Um, because we want to think of how to reshape our economic system out of this crisis in a just and democratic way. And what we want to do is uh, break down complex uh, macroeconomic uh, and financial issues, and in that way, democratize knowledge and provide you with the necessary tools to change uh, the world. Um, so for this next series, we'll be organizing a webinar every two weeks. So that's twice a month. And uh, of every webinar, there'll be a recording, a podcast, and also a summary. Um, and now Rodrigo will introduce uh, briefly our new series. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, well, um, today is a very... Um full uh, episode so i'll just very uh, keep it very brief um the first series was on monetary policy uh, central banks and ideology uh, and all of these episodes are available on our website so if you haven't seen them please visit the website um so this second series uh today is the first episode of this second series um in the second series we, we will uh, look into this these growing signs uh, of a new generation of debt crisis that seems to be um, brewing in the global south. Um, so there have been ebb and flow movements of capital in and out of developing countries uh, in the past decades. Uh, but uh, what happened since the COVID-19 crisis seems to be something exceptional. So uh, in, this, um, in this second series, uh, we want to look at the structural issues uh, and, and, and the structural problems that the global south faces and the longer term issues and not only look at what COVID-19 has triggered, uh, but what type of problems uh, there are uh, that can be and what type of solutions we foresee. Uh, and so and today uh, we're very happy to have Andrew Fisher with us. Um, yeah, so I'll tell you maybe a bit more about the practicalities and the setup of the webinar. So uh, Andrew Fisher will be briefly uh, introduced shortly by me. Um, and thereafter, we'll have uh, his presentation for about 15 minutes. Uh, then we will interview him for another uh, 15 minutes. And uh, finally, we'll have a round of questions uh, from your side that will be read out uh, by Rodrigo and me. Now, you can put your questions in the special Q&A tab, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. So please don't put your questions in the chat, but put them in the Q&A tab. And we'll make a selection uh, based on the questions that are favored. And if you like a question, uh, you can endorse it with a thumbs up. And in that way, uh, the question pops up um, at, the, at the top of the screen and it will make it easier for us uh, to select them. Um, so I'm very pleased that we have Andrew Fisher here today. Uh, Andrew Fisher is Associate Professor of Social Policy and Development Studies at the ISS. And he's also the scientific director of CEDES, which is the Dutch Research School for International uh, Development. Um, his latest book is called Poverty as Ideology from 2018. And it was awarded with the International Studies in Poverty Prize by the Comparative Research Program on Poverty, CROP and Z Books. 
And as part of the award, it's fully open access. We've put it on our website and I've also listened to some podcasts on it. We'll put it on the website too. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, really cool that he can share his book with us here. Um, and Andrew is also, uh, since 2015, leading a European Research Council funded project on the political economy of externally financing social policy in developing countries. And I guess he'll tell us uh, a bit more about that today in his presentation. So um, I'd say uh, off to you, Andrew, and uh, good luck with your presentation. We're looking forward to it. Hello, everyone. And uh, yeah, this wonderful initiative. Uh, and I was really happy to receive the invitation and, and share some of my thoughts. I don't think I'll be telling you much today, too much about the debt crisis we'll be facing. I guess I'm starting from the position of saying, uh, in order to understand the path forward, we have to look to the past. And how we understand the past is extremely important to how we then understand, understand the challenges and in particular, the choices that we have facing us going into the future. And the, the, the issue, uh, if I, I'll just share my uh, screen so you can have something to look at besides me. Um, but the issue I'll uh, be looking at, focusing on, is this issue of um, <clears throat> uh, external constraints in development, essentially. Because I think there's underlying, uh, especially on a lot of the left, I think, there's perhaps with some rightful justification, a uh, rejection of external debt. And this idea that external debt is a vice, it's uh, an addiction perhaps that countries are hooked onto willingly or not, uh, and that successful countries in the past avoided it. Um, and they exported their way to success instead. Uh, it's a common narrative you hear even in academic papers. Uh, I mean, first of all, I would say it's wrong. <laughs> and I think it's important to understand why it's wrong. Uh, it's wrong because successful countries, if we think of the few successful developing countries that went from being poor to relatively rich in the post-war period being the typical Korea, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, and, and a few other countries like that, um, they relied on a lot of finance, uh, debt in particular, but not importantly, not so much FDI, not so much foreign direct investment, but more debt. Um, and so I think actually creating a narrative where you uh, suggest that they didn't is actually doing a disservice to our understanding of the challenges that developing countries face and also sets up false expectations of what they might be able to achieve going into the future. So um, uh, basically what, what we're then focusing on is this idea of external constraints of like development. I think this really goes to the core of um, what we would call structuralist development economics or structuralist macroeconomics which is really a field that came out of the very early period of early development economics in the post-war period and has since more or less disappeared um, from the mainstream at least uh, under sort of the shift to the neoliberal period in the 70s onwards, uh, more or less got wiped aside. Uh, but the core of this was really this idea of external constraints of late development. This is essentially that Development in itself is constrained internally by certain factors and externally by certain factors. And the external factors that are really constraining development are basically the, the, especially for late developing countries, meaning countries that were attempting to industrialize post-war uh, from a peripheral decolonizing position and so on, a subordinate position. Typically, the development process for them was extremely import intensive. And as a result, it was very foreign exchange intensive. Uh, and there was also a dependence on imports, right? So, I mean, what does this essentially mean? Um, it's, uh, well, actually, just let me make one point. It's not just that the countries coming out of, say, a decolonized era are dependent from a starting point, but it's also the process of development itself intensifies and exacerbates that import dependence and that import intensiveness, right? Uh, and the reasons why are basically, so the idea here is that unconstrained, unconstrained uh, development tends to generate trade deficits because of import intensity and dependence. Uh, and the reasons are, uh, if you think of it in sort of simple terms, the economic infrastructure of developing countries, this is, I, I, you know, um, um, or whatever term you wish to use, the global south or, or, or whatever, uh, is extremely dependent on imports. You can think of a good example I always like to give is, is Kenya. Uh, when they developed their mobile phone network, uh, it required just for setting up the network about three billion U.S. dollars. 
uh, and it had to be in US, US dollars because all of that material that was used to build up the network was not produced in Kenya. It was produced, it was produced elsewhere and imported. Um, so even before we can talk about how a farmer can use mobile phones to get to know better prices for their crops in the local market, you, the government already or somebody has to put down 3 billion US dollars, right? And then the other thing too is that often it, you could do it through debt, in which case the government maybe can control it and subcontract it, or you could just give it to a foreign company and then they own the network, right? And then that, that, that locks you into your economic infrastructure gets locked into an important dependence, right? Whereas to, as you move to from uh, 2G to 3G to 4G to, you know, uh, <laughs> oh, help you, uh, 5G um, and so on, you, you then require continued reinvestment into the network, all of which requires foreign exchange and so on. You can make the same uh, analysis to ports, to transport, Industrial policy, when we talk about industrial policy, if you talk about reverse engineering, what is that? You bring in imports, you take them apart, you destroy it, try and figure out how it works, rebuild it, bring in more imports. You do that over five, 10 years and you finally learn how to build a car. It's a very import intensive process, right? Um, and um, so basically the, the development process, especially if we understand development at its core involving industrialization, or urbanization, urbanization without slums, urbanization with well-developed public infrastructure, public transportation involves a very, very strong import intensity. Right? And the important point to make here as well, and this is why we call it structuralist, is because it's structural. It's, it's, it's based on the technological and input characteristics of production and consumption in a world that's becoming industri increasingly industrialized, regardless of whether the country itself produces the and the, the goods they're, they're consuming, right? There's other factors that exacerbate it, luxury consumption and so on, but it's, it's these core features that drive the demand for imports and hence the demand for some form of foreign exchange to pay for the imports, right? And the important point too is that it worsens with industrialization. So even though industrialization is proposed as a way to get out of this, in actual historical fact, industrialization strategies usually worsened this problem, right? Um, and this leads to chronic shortages of foreign exchange, obviously, right? Because you're constantly, everything, whatever you want to do, if you have a development plan, a government says, what are our top hundred priorities? Probably most of them would involve a lot of foreign exchange needs, right? Um, if, if, uh, if, a, you know, if you go to any particular government and to ask them what are their top, top hundred things they would like to do in the next five years. So as a result, what it, what it means is that foreign exchange becomes a specific constraint distinct from savings, right? I could go into this, I don't have time, uh, but uh, that's just an important point to keep in mind. And the other point is that um, the external accounts of a country in these settings tend to dominate other macroeconomic variables. And this was a very important point for early structuralism because what they were saying is that both Keynesian, Keynesian, sorry, both Keynesianism and neoclassical economics did not apply very well to these types of peripheral post-war settings um, uh, because, because they were both referring to relatively industrialized settings that didn't have necessarily these external constraints in the way developing countries do. This is possibly, there's a whole discussion to be had as well about modern monetary theory if from this perspective in, in that sense as well, which I don't have time to go into. I'll skip the last point. You can read it on your own time, but because I can already see the time ticking <laughs> and I'm sure uh, Rodrigo's getting already uh, uh, worried about how I'm progressing. But uh, there's another side of this, which I've also written about, and I can send you more articles if there's interest in it, which is what I call the symbiosis between aid and or redistribution and development, which is the fact that parallel to this, in order for a country to absorb aid or foreign exchange, it actually has to run trade deficits. Because this comes from, um, I don't know how to summarize this in 30 seconds, but, but absorption of foreign funds uh, basically in a net sense, once everything is netted out and you have a net transfer of foreign resources into a country, uh, the implication is that that country is consuming or investing more than they produce or earn, right? So that is by definition a trade deficit. It's not, it's not a theory, it's just an accounting identity. It's, 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 a, it's a logical, it's like saying your income equals what you spend and what you save. Uh, therefore, your saving equals what you earn minus what you spend, right? something like that. That's an accounting identity. Um, and so in the balance of payments accounting identity, you have the current account. Uh, I was told to quickly summarize current account. Current account 
is basically your trade balance, exports minus imports of goods and services, as well as your income account, which is basically things like profit remittances, wage remittances, uh, and other types of things like that. Aid falls into that income transfer. Uh, uh, so aid flows fall, fall in there. And then the financial account, which is often known as the capital account, is basically all your financial flows. It's um, foreign direct investment, uh, portfolio investment, uh, uh, debt flows, uh, other types of speculative flows, and also reserves and gold and things like that. And then, of course, you have errors and emissions. So that's essentially the balance of payments. And the implication there is that the current account, by definition, it's not a theory, it's just by definition, the current account equals the inverse of the financial account. That if you have a trade deficit, you need to have some fund flow of funds coming in to finance that trade deficit, right? Um, and it's, but that, in that sense, if you have a trade surplus, you actually have an outflow of finance from your country, right? Uh, so actually you're not absorbing aid if you're actually running a surplus in that sense, or you're not absorbing foreign finance if you're running a surplus. Uh, and so it was in this sense that in early development economics, it was what I call a classic post-war consensus is that aid was justified by virtue of the fact that it was financing trade deficits, which were required for countries to industrialize uh, and to develop in other ways as well. Uh, and so I, what I, I've been arguing uh, for many years is that the role of aid or debt needs to be understood relative to this symbiosis, right? Um, in other words, Aid is the, the role of aid can only be understood partly in terms of playing this redistributive role to finance a process of development, not just simply consumption, right? Um, I'll skip the last point for the interest of time because I wanted to show you a few graphs to actually give you some sense of what actually happened historically. But just to go over this, the, this slide, essentially in the post-war context, countries were facing two strategies, facing these types of external constraints. You can either try and trade your way out of the external constraint so you try and export as much as possible, or you practice import substitution, which means trying to get rid of imports as much as possible, uh, or you can finance your way out of it. So you run a trade deficit and you rely on either aid or foreign direct investment or debt or portfolio flows or whatever uh, other financial flow you can muster. And in all historical cases, we actually see a mix of both strategies, right? And even, even in South Korea and Taiwan, they're arguably both export oriented and practicing import substitution at the same time. Uh, and what's crucial, I think, when you look at the historical cases, this, this South Korea and Taiwan, for instance, that the aid and abundant supplies of long-term stable and affordable con concessional finance uh, was crucial for these countries to manage these constraints that they were facing. They faced them very intensively in, the, in, this, in this foreign, the supply of foreign transfers through aid as well of, as, as well as debt was crucial, but not foreign direct investment. And I just would argue, you know, expanding on this, that these things are crucial to understand the political economy of development. Uh, in addition to the standard things you read about industrial policy, state developmentalism, and so on. Um, understanding, of course, that what we're talking about here are constraints. It's not explaining development. Uh, industrialization and other processes like that remain as the causal core. But as said, these causal factors that are causing development are constrained by these external factors which can block it, stunt it, subordinate it, uh, make it fall into crisis and go into two lost decades like what we've seen in sort of sub-Saharan Africa. What we see in the case of Republic of Korea is that it overcomes these constraints with a combination of aid and debt. It doesn't actually overcome them with export orientation because even as I was exporting, it was importing even more than it was exporting. It was extremely, it was like an import guzzler basically, the Korean model. Uh, Brazil and China, they have different uh, ways of dealing with this type of um, uh, these external constraints, um, but each with different aspects of vulnerability and what I would say is perversion, Brazil being very crisis prone in that sense. Uh, this is just to give you the evidence, because um, uh, this is probably the most important figure <laughs> in the whole presentation. The rest I probably won't have time to cover, but maybe we can come back to them. But what we see here is I'm just mapping out the current account of Republic of Korea, South Korea from 53, the end of the civil war up to 2010. And what you see, if you can see my cursor is that entire first period from 1953, right up to 1980 and beyond. Oops, sorry. Uh, you see this, the dotted line is the trade deficit in goods. 
averaging over a 20 to 30 year period, probably in the range of eight to 10% of GDP. So it's a massively, it's a very deep, and this is at a time when there was not a lot of private finance flowing around the world. So the only way they could finance this, this trade deficit was through aid flows. And then later in the 60s and 70s, as aid was ebbing off this red line, it, uh, the role of debt took over. And then actually South Korea became heavily, heavily indebted in the, um, in the 70s, uh, much like Latin America, probably more intensively debt indebted than Latin America. The key difference in the case of South Korea was that when crisis hit in 82, um, uh, basically uh, international financial institutions, the US and Japan were willing to extend a huge amount of um, official lending to South Korea when that official lending essentially dried up and became nothing in in say Latin America and Africa. And it was only arguably, it was only because of that, that Korea managed to pass through this very vulnerable stage of their industrialization in the absence of which they would have had a lot more difficulty. Uh, the second slide is um, just showing that this, I mean, the only thing to see here is this huge surge of public loans that was extended from the late seventies into the mid eighties to Korea when essentially the same figure for Brazil or a Latin American country or an African country would basically be flatlining essentially, right? Um, so it's to make this point, a lot of people would say, look, in South Korea, it's about geopolitics, right? It's, it's about uh, the, the, post, the Cold War, the US supporting Korea because of the threat of communism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The same story is often given for why they tolerated industrial policy. And I, the point I always make is that, yes, true, I'm the first to say that, but the point is that where there is a will, there's a way, right? If we would take climate change with the same seriousness as we take, or global poverty and inequality with the same seriousness as they took the communist threat in the Cold War, you, we could achieve these things. It's not impossible. It's if, there, if there's a will to achieve it, we could achieve these things. But it's just that when there's not a will and when it falls back into a sort of non-threatening situation, then basically you get more of the situation that happened in Latin America or in Africa or in other world regions. And this is the example of Brazil where you see the exact opposite of the South Korean model. Actually throughout most of the, the post-war period, Brazil was running trade surpluses instead of trade deficits in goods. Uh, and uh, so these dotted line again is the surpluses. It's above zero, it means it's a surplus. It was only in the 70s when Brazil, for a short period of time, went into its second phase of import substitution industrialization, was borrowing heavily commercial debt and hence sunk into this thick dotted line of interest payments on debt, uh, which has eventually led it into crisis, where it had its short period where it looked like South Korea of, bring, of importing really intensively to support its second stage industrialization, which then ended out in crisis, right? Um, and I mean, it's not too much more to say here, but the point again is that the surpluses, the country's earning surpluses, but because as I said before, the current account is the inverse of the financial account uh, the, or the trade account is the inverse of everything else. These goods services are actually paying, are leaving the country through payments to services, which is finance, insurance, transport um, of goods and other such things, as well as income payments on debt. Uh, so, and as a result, I mean, if you look at 2010, the amazing thing with Brazil is it looked structurally in terms of its balance of payments, more or less the same as it looked like in 1947, which was a, a, a surplus financing uh, huge outflows in payments to, to foreigners for services and for income, and then also borrowing extra to be able to facilitate that, which is what we see in the next slide but I've run out of time to discuss this. But I just, this is the financial kind of Brazil, which I always like to say, it sort of looks like a, a samba dance steps or something, but uh, <laughs> we can skip over that. Um, uh, this is all in my article, so I'll let you read it on your own time. The point here is that something I always like to say is that the dark black line, if I get my cursor, this line is the exports per, uh, as a percentage of GDP for uh, Korea, South Korea versus Brazil's, which is the, the down here. And the dotted line is the import as a percent of GDP. And what we do see in Korea is this remarkable takeoff in exports from the 60s up until the um, 70s. Um, so this is this export success story of Korea. But what's important here is that in, it, it was running this intensive trade deficit throughout this increase. And arguably, and anyone 
period of time, or if you look at the, its, its ability to increase exports was based on a pre-existing ability to increase imports by about a lag of five to 10 years. And I think this is what's critical is that in, as successful as it was in any particular period of time to increase, ex, uh, to increase exports, this was based on its ability to build up a development model that was very, very important intensive, right? Um, now, when we come to the neoliberal era, which I'll summarize in about 30 seconds, uh, <laughs> if you allow me, the problem is that the whole story gets messed up. Post 80s, we have liberalization, we have financialization. The pre 80s was special because you had developmental states, industrial policy was accepted. You had capital controls, even in you know, uh, what were considered pro-Western liberal countries. You had limited private finance to control besides foreign direct investment and then debt from the 60s onwards. And you also had the US running trade surpluses, which meant that the US was actually ejecting uh, finance into the world as well as having running trade surpluses. That was sort of the gravitational uh, direction of, of flows. Whereas today, the situation is far more convoluted. You have a lot of countries actually running quite deep deficits, but these aren't necessarily developmental deficits. They're more based on uh, deficits that are driven by consumption of liberalized economies who are importing a lot of consumption goods, and it's not necessarily investment oriented. Uh, examples like that, if I'd have the time to show you, would be Philippines and Cambodia. If you're interested in more, we, we, we could look at those. Financialization also throws in a lot of complications. And my example for that is Zambia is a fantastic case because what you see in Zambia is, is well, Zambia basically looks like Brazil, where you have surpluses basically being drained by payments to foreigners on the service account and the income account. But at the same time, in the financial account, you see over the last five to 10 years, this rapid buildup of public debt uh, um, uh, compensating a massive outflow of private financial assets, which actually the Zambian Central Bank, I interviewed them about it, they didn't even know how to explain it. Uh, and they were trying to figure it out with the IMF. Um, um, and they were coming to, to, to an answer about it. But basically you find this public indebtedness some people have called it a rotating door, a public indebtedness being built up to facilitate, it's even nothing to do with import consumption, it's to do with facilitating private asset outflows, which is quite possibly in the case of Zambia, the mining companies uh, uh, basically moving assets or wealth uh, or through transfer pricing and so on out of the country. Uh, and also you're in a world where the US is running massive trade deficits. Of course, we just heard that the US ran its record highest trade deficit ever recorded. Uh, and this is so this creates a sort of gravitation gravitational situation where the US is actually absorbing net financial flows rather than sort of ejecting net financial flows right. Um, and of course, we have the Chinese surpluses I have no time to discuss China I have a whole bunch of because a lot of my previous work was on China. Uh, these are graphs that I don't have time now to show you but this was the story I was going to tell you about Zambia if I had another 40 minutes. Uh, and. This is, as I said, this is like Brazil, where you have the dotted line being goods services. So this is the copper boom in, in a very short-lived copper boom in Zambia, basically being drained out by uh, the red line, which is pay, basically profit remittances of mining companies. And then the green line, which is payments to services, which is like shipping, insurance, and whatever. So basically, even though you have the surplus in these years, even in these years right here, you actually had a current account deficit, even though you had a surplus on the trade goods, uh, trade and goods account. Um, uh, and then of course, this is this wacky financial situation that we see in Zambia with the green line reflecting uh, basically, um, sorry, with the green line is your foreign direct investment, which is huge, massive uh, relative to the economy. Uh, and then the red line um, being uh, other investment. But if you break that down, what you essentially see is the, um, uh, yeah, what you, well, I would have to take more time to explain it, but you essentially see this build up of public indebtedness, basically paying off um, um, the, 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 the sort of Zambian residents, which could be Anglo-American Zambia incorporated, moving assets out of the country, right? Uh, Ethiopia, on the other hand, if I can just give a few little, little schmidzens of, of ideas here. Ethiopia is, is a fascinating case because it shows the exact opposite story. It's more like the South Korea of Africa in that sense, where as it's been starting to accelerate its growth very rapidly in the 2000s, it goes into extremely deep 
trade and goods deficit, far deeper than what we saw in Korea, which is desperately trying to finance with aid and rem wage remittances and, and all sorts of things. Uh, and of course, in 2017, and it's in negotiations with the IMF, the IMF basically came, they came to an agreement with the IMF that they could no longer borrow. And, and so now they're restricted to only grant money or wage remittances to continue financing this model, which I think explains a lot of the problems they're facing economically. The Philippines is a case of uh, a trade deficit, a very deep trade deficit, again, of about 10% of GDP, but it's consumption oriented. If you talk to Filipino economists or development specialists, they bemoan the fact that basically there's no industrial policy, and this is largely con consumption driven deficits being financed by remittances, which is the blue line at the top. Uh, and of course, in Cambodia is a very similar story, a very different country, but similar story of a very, very deep deficit, but that's largely consumption based rather than industrial policy, being again financed by a mix of aid in this case and remittances and so on. So that was just to give you, you know, showing that always makes you look authoritative. So anyways, the, the, but they're fascinating. Each one of those is fascinating story and very, very different. Actually, when I started a lot of this research, I, I assumed I would see more homogeneity across developing countries than I do in terms of their balance of payments. So we actually, what we see is a variety of different patterns emerging, but they're all very disoriented and, 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 and disjointed in that sense. So all of this, I would say, highlights the need for redistribution uh, and serious alternatives to the current development finance models, but only on a foundation of productive structural transformation, which remains the remote, remote cause of development in that sense, economic development at least. Uh, and we can talk about how this relates to climate change, but you know that, that's at least we have to you know, recognize this. And, and, and this whole story about external constraints is about the constraints. It's about the constraints to these causes of what drives development. So I'll leave it there. I think I've gone over time quite a bit. <laughs> and I hope that was okay. Hi, Andrew. Yeah, no, it's, it's okay. Uh, sorry yeah. to, to, have, uh, to have to rush you through this story. No, no, no. Uh, that's not it's, um, <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's really interesting to see this uh, variety of capitalism uh, in the global south, uh, yeah. well, all seeing these the, the similar constraints, but yet, well, having these different reactions to it. But mm. I, I have a question um, well, about your your yeah, your central argument. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you basically say that um, uh, so development requires a, a form of imports of capital, uh, mm -hmm. one way or another. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, well, I think that. Not a lot of people would disagree with you, mm -hmm. um, although you th you think differently. Uh, but uh, um, uh, the the question, of course, is uh, what type of capital and under which condition. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, yeah, perhaps f if if I if I may reduce it to a very sim to simple categories, uh, you could have good good debt debt linked to. Uh, productive investments, investments that uh, may generate future income. And then, of course, you have bad debt uh, linked to speculative activities or activities, uh, well, simple consumption by uh, upper class uh, corporations, uh, moving assets outside, uh, uh, carry trade and so on. Mm -hmm. And in the current context, uh, the new liberal context, uh, um, and, and the context of financialization, that many financial flows move in and out of the country unrelated to underlying mm -hmm. productive activities. Um, how, so what type of medicine would you envision to, to get the, the good type of debt? Uh, what type of const constraints do you think would, be, would need to be required for capital flows to, to have a good uh, effect instead of this bad effect? Yes, well, that's that's um, uh, <laughs> that's a huge question, but uh, well, I think you know you you really go to the point precisely. I think it's very good. Uh, you have good debt and you have bad debt in that sense, and you have um, Arthur Lewis, who's this, one of the pioneers of development economics, um, uh, was writing in seventy eight. Uh, he was he was uh, from Saint Lucia in the Caribbean, and he, he was writing in seventy eight. He was a big anti you know, uh, sort of anti-imperialist, um, a lot of people don't recognize him for that. And it, he was saying there's a demonization of debt in a sense, right? Uh, because actually what debt does, as long as you can manage it, it preserves your sovereignty. It preserves your autonomy. Foreign direct investment, on the other hand, 
basically it means the denationalization of your economy, right? You no longer control your economy. And what he argued is that he said, look, us Caribbeans, Africans, Latin Americans, we can manage our own companies. We can manage our own uh, economies. What we need is the finance, right? So what we need, but you, you definitely, you need the finance to support Yes, industrial policy. Uh, and there are a lot of economists who do recognize this stuff, as you say, and they would argue, well, the, the accumulation of debt should be limited only to, to um, investing in those activities that actually earn income so you can pay back your debt. Okay, well, it's a sensible argument, right? The only problem with that argument is there's a lot of sunk investments in development that do require foreign exchange and that do not earn money, right? Like roads, if you don't make roads a, a commodity or <laughs> electricity, if you don't actually sell your good electricity at extremely high prices uh, and sell it off to Vivian Water or, 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 or whatever, uh, and, or, or Perrier or whatever, uh, or public transportation, if you don't actually try and make it profitable, if you actually subsidize public transportation, uh, for various things like that, if, if, if you know, a lot of these public goods that do require investment, do require foreign exchange, can't necessarily be expected to generate profits to be able to pay back these loans. So we do need long-term concessional debt. Uh, uh, I mean, and this is, I mean, some people always kind of joke about how the UK only finished paying off its Marshall Plan loans in like a couple of years ago. And they say, look how ridiculous it is. The, U the UK has been paying off these loans for so long. I'm like, actually, no, that is amazing. That shows what the Marshall Plan was doing. It was giving 70 year low interest rate loans that the UK, a rich country could use then to do very slow, slow, uh, you know, uh, patient investment in long-term projects. They didn't have to think about what the margin was in one year or two years or five years, right? And I think that's crucial. Uh, um, it is, it's, it's, I think, I think that's the first point is, but, but then yes, you need to, all the speculative investment, all that stuff. I mean, it's for me, when you really look at the big macro picture and what's going on, a lot of it is noise, right? Uh, a lot of it is not helpful to quite contrary to the neoliberal neoclassical argument that it's the, the price mechanism that's helping the allocation of resources. It's completely distorting these economies and throwing them, just completely turning them up. Sorry, but down. isn't that, isn't that exactly the, the aim of the G20 World Bank yes, project no, on financing yeah, for yeah, development. Yeah, yeah. So is, isn't that exactly think, what, yeah. for example, the, the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands is backing, yeah. is exactly having a system in place that uh, creates, well, transforms uh, the global south into assets that can be traded on financial markets, exactly. uh, which, which no, doesn't exactly. necessarily bring development. No. No, because you're you're forcing every single form of financial flow into it's like microfinance it's like uh, you end up paying uh people poor people end up paying 70 80 percent on their their microfinance debt right uh it's like uh these countries they fall into crisis and their 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 policy rates go up to 30 40 percent right like in in zambia or in ghana or in various other countries that once they actually then fall into currency crises because they can't manage these external constraints jack up the policy rate and then, you know, basically render the financial system irrelevant so, for local financial needs, right? And I that, think that Sarah has a question yeah. also related to this issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I was thinking of the current situation of many countries in the global south now. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they're very heavily indebted. Uh, mm -hmm. There are some goals for debt jubilees, but those goals hasn't, haven't been answered yet. Uh, I think the global north is also very preoccupied with itself, eh? like financing its own crisis, but also stuff like the Green Deal. And then on the other hand, there's a whole range of, for example, trade and investment treaties that is being brokered now mm -hmm. by European mm -hmm. Union and other trading blocs. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of countries are in a very dire situation in which they're very heavily indebted, in which maybe there's not really the political will to mm -hmm. hand out enough public loans. And then on the other hand, there's all these private creditors, but also a lot of in investment companies and investors pushing for uh, new investment agreements. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm quite afraid that a lot of countries will say, okay, let those foreign direct investments come in because we can't wait for debt jubilee. We can't wait for new public loans. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, how could we prevent that situation? Because I think uh, that would be very bad because uh, as you say, letting in uh, foreign direct investment has often led to a less economic sovereignty. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And it also really matters who owns uh, uh, the the who's the creditor. So I mean, uh, right now I've been looking at is there any political will um, to put your ideas into practice? I don't see it happening at this moment. So what what which institutions, which countries should take the lead, and how can we prevent that foreign direct uh, investments will take over in the end again? Yeah, I mean. Uh... Yeah, when people talk about the death in neoliberalism, from this perspective, there's no death whatsoever. It's as vigorous and <laughs> lively as ever. Uh, and you know, I'm, I, I, you know, I completely agree with. I know you had Daniela Gabor on your previous series. Uh, her and I would see, you know, eye to eye on, on these issues. I, you know, in terms of, I'm an idealist. I say, how do, how would the world need to look if we would actually have massive amounts of redistribution and how would things need to be restructured? Do I have any hope that we're going to get there in the, in the short period? It's, it's, it's like the desperation of people working on climate change and watching actually how worse the situation has gotten in the last 10 years rather than improvement, right? Um, uh, and yes, I agree that the whole finance for development model, what I, uh, my belief is that we need the World Bank, but the World Bank needs to get back to its original purpose. Getting out of all these policy advice areas and so on, it just, it's a public bank that needs to provide patient finance, slow finance, long-term concessional loans to developing countries, uh, which is what it should be doing. The IMF, okay, st stabilization support because countries need stabilization support, but without the imposition of these extremely draconian types of uh, things. And without also, my research project deals with the, the social policy side of this in terms of, uh, yes, agree to our program, but uh, slash your pensions created, which is politically problematic for a lot of governments and bring in targeted social protection programs and, and actually just uh, go backwards from a social policy perspective rather than forwards as well on, the, on that angle. And it's all tied together because they use the finance to push through these various agendas rather than actually having a much more, um, um, uh, what would be the right word, the uh, uh, much more... Um, so, I mean, sorry. Uh, yeah, Jan Kregel, Jan Kregel is a fantastic economist who's inspired me a lot, talks about it, how there's this contradiction. The IMF sees things in terms of maintaining international financial stability, which goes against the needs of development. Right? The needs of development requires imbalances in the world system, and it requires the rich countries to support the imbalances of poor countries. The IMF is constantly oriented towards actually trying to iron out those imbalances, right? uh, which is actually to the detriment and is punitive on developing countries to try and achieve what they need to achieve. Right? So, well, per per Perhaps if yeah. we would organize the IMF according to the lines of uh, uh, Keynes' original vision, uh, it would be a bit different. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I have a question about uh, also about the IMF. Um, so it seems that there's a, a sort of a, a dualism in the IMF that uh, the, when it comes to actual policy uh, towards uh, countries in deficit, it, it imposes still the structural adjustment types of mm -hmm. programs and mm -hmm. philosophy and austerity. Um, but uh, in its research, uh, it is, uh, well, it seems to be ever more concerned about uh, the problem itself is creating. Mm -hmm. But the, the research part, the brains seem not to be connected with what the hand is doing. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that is that is actually the case? Or is it, is it simply PR? Or is it a struggle inside of the IMF? Is, there, is the mainstream... Is mainstream economics well uh, reaching uh, 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 something uh, at the end here in 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 reality because the the crisis is uh, pushing it too far or is 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 there not really a dualism in the in the IMF? Maybe to add to that because there's also yeah. a question from one of the uh, attendees that's more or less on the same topic, uh, so we can already maybe mm -hmm. take it in. Uh, it's by Guus Geurts, and he asked, "What is the role of structural adjustment programs mm -hmm. at the World Bank and IMF on development?" You already said something about it, but mm -hmm. yeah, maybe you could envision a bit more how how an ideal IMF and uh, ideal World Bank would look mm -hmm. like, and and whether there's actual change going on or whether it's only like greenwashing, as mm -hmm. as would I think also uh, mm -hmm. yeah has hinted that. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I, I definitely, I know that it's not only, I think there's a disjuncture between the, 
the research bureaus and the country offices, which are the country offices are the ones that hold power. They're the ones who do the negotiation. It's the same thing for the World Bank as well. I think the, the World Bank, the research department, the policy departments, they can start talking about a lot of really nice ideas, but ultimately it really comes down to what is the country office doing and what are they negotiating with the government? And there's a, even today, there's a very, very strong uh, disconnect between those two. Um, so, uh, um, but that being said, I wouldn't, I mean, I'm not jumping for joy just because the research offices look a bit more progressive, right? <laughs> it's like, I think, okay, good, but you know, it took you a while, you know, to get there in that sense, but stru structural adjustment policies and, um, but that being said, I, you know, I don't have my experience of being in the positions there. And so the types of, you know, <laughs> Be, being in that role. You, you may imagine you are. So. I can imagine, yeah. Yeah, I can do an intellectual exercise. But, but the, the, you know, the, the, role of SAP, the role of SAPs, and I think, um, obviously, I mean, the IMF, uh, a lot of its monetarist programs in the 50s resembled what happened in the 80s and onwards and so on. But it's really what you find is the, the scale of the debt crisis in the 80s uh, and, and the approach that the IMF took to that and then the supportive role of the World Bank in terms of a sort of cartel uh, is continuing up to today. I mean, as far as you can see, there's, you know, the modifications to it, but it's essentially to impose the, the cost of adjustment on the debtor country, on the country that's gone into crisis. Uh, and in, in, by imposing austerity, by basically opposing adjustment. I mean, the simple example in Latin America in the eighties was that, and there's this wonderful study by Carlos Diaz Alejandro that I always like to refer to, which is, you know, all of the countries, regardless of their differences, all more or less fell into the country in the same way. So you can look at each one of them and blame them for different reasons, but it was systemic, right? And the point is, is that it was very easy for them to quickly, and I can sh show you in one of the graphs on Brazil, very quickly generate trade surpluses to pay off creditors. Because all you have to do, given what I've been talking about in the presentation, is collapse your economy. You collapse your economy because you're structurally dependent on imports. You, you, by reducing your consumption of imports, you free up your foreign exchange. Uh, and, and then you free up resources to pay off your creditors, which is basically what they all did. Within a year, all these countries turned their situations around, generated very, very large um, trade surpluses to pay off debt by going into massive economic crisis, right? Uh, you can do that in various ways. You can jack up interest rates, you can devalue the currency, you can, you know, the, the way they did it then would be different from the way they do it now, but it's essentially the same thing we see in each case where a country facing a debt crisis is facing a wall <laughs> that they can't, you know, move. And then the, 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 after negotiating, 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 the, the, the imposition is placed on them to adjust to the crisis. And the main way of adjusting to the crisis is by imposing austerity and, and basically running yourself into the ground, right? I mean, this is why Africa partly went through two decades of the so-called lost decades of, or what Tandika Mekandere has now decided to call, well, he just passed away earlier this year, but he, he was calling, you know, Africa's Great Depression, but um, it's because, you know, you force these countries to just adjust by basically collapsing your economy, right? Uh, collapsing public investment, collapsing public investment in particular, uh, which is a major consumer of foreign exchange. Uh, and of course, it's not a wise strategy because in the long run, as people would say, in the long run, it's much better to maintain your debts, maintain your deficits, and continue the investment because in the long run, the creditors will be much better off if you keep paying your debt and growing and having more debt and so on. The, 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 the approach of just collapsing these economies is not a very, it's a very short term, not a very wise long term approach, even if you're- Sorry, Andrew, can I, can I break in? Yes, yes. Um, I, I just wanted to ask a related question uh, by um, Anna uh, Wolkenhauer. Yeah, yeah um, I know. I hope I pronounced his name uh, correctly. Uh, so if trade deficits, are due to consumption uh, and not de developmental investments. Mm -hmm. Is the difference explained by external factors or domestic decision as to where to spend money? Well, I think there's a mix of both, right? I mean, if it was entirely based on the, the choice at the low domestic level of where do you spend your money, I mean, that would be, you know, I think there's, I think that's a marginal influence in the sense that, um, um, uh, yeah, it might influence how much on the margins, but the core of your consumption is still being driven by your needs, right? It's being driven by your consumption needs. Uh, it, uh, you know, in the sense that, 
as Celso Furtado said, you know, we live in this industrial civilization. Even if you're not producing the goods, you're consuming this industrial output, right? And so you, the, the more your consumption becomes dependent on that, those forms of, of, of production, and if you're not producing it yourself, you can well say, I'm not going to consume it, but then what are you going to do, right? So you know, um, uh, it's uh, everything we consume around us is industrialized right now. So, so you could say it's just choice. We don't have to consume these things. We don't have to consume cars. We don't have to consume packaged goods, but everyone does. Now, are we going to say that's you should be just satisfied and live like a peasant and consume your own food? Or are we accepting the fact that the world has changed, right? That people structural, uh, and this is why I talk about actually a lot in my poverty book, is that the structural foundations of people's social needs essentially has transformed quite dramatically over the last 50, 60 years, right? In terms of how poor people consume, right? And, mm, yeah. and the, the, the degree to which that consumption is, is, you know, it's they don't have a lot of choice in how they consume, right? So, um, you know, if you just realistically... Can, can I can I ask another question? Yeah, because yeah. Uh, the, uh, there are many people attending that have questions to you. I, I don't know if you can see the, the Q&A. I, I have, Probably I, not I because you're, yeah, you're, you're busy. Is, Zoom, you're, it's hard to... Uh, yeah, you're, you're busy talking to us. It, it, it doesn't matter, but... Uh, it's, now, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm just very sorry already to many of the people that ask a question that we will not be able to address all of them. So but, uh, one, one thing to solve this is if you like a question a lot, you can vote for it. You can endorse ah, it. So okay, okay. we don't yeah. have too many questions that yeah. remain unanswered. So we don't pick the questions. It's just uh, democracy. They pick themselves. Yeah. Uh, but, but one question by, uh, again, I don't know if I will pronounce your name, name correctly, uh, Ryan Joseph Martinez. That's a question about the Philippines. Uh, so in the case of the Philippines, um, is it still feasible to sustain national industrialization? Uh, how do you think they should proceed in order to be successful? Sorry, say that again. I, you see, this is the problem of multitasking. I started reading the questions and I, 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 I just yeah. don't know. Sorry, say that again. Okay, so this, this is in the case yeah. of the Philippines. Is it still feasible to sustain national industrialization? How do you think... Uh, this should proceed in order for it to be successful? Um, yes, I mean, industrialization would be a whole different topic, but yes, I think so. I don't have the time to explain why, but obviously, I mean, it's, it's um, um, and this is a tricky thing with the whole discussion of climate as well, uh, but insofar as you need to increase the productivity of labor for improving living standards, and insofar as we need to improve living standards in poor countries in you know one form or another this involves industrialization right so i, th I think it has to be on the agenda it has to be a strategy governments need to engage on it it needs to be national programs uh and, and it needs to be financed uh and it's getting more and more difficult to do and it's getting more and more difficult to finance uh because it's different if you have to generate returns to pay back your loans of five percent or fifteen percent or you know, whatever the financing financing terms uh, would be. Um, so, um, um, uh, just to break break in, do you think that would you say that the current context is less favorable than forty years ago? Yes, or, definitely. definitely. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Well, I mean, there's some countries that have been successful in latching on into value chains and so on. China has been very successful. It's a whole discussion we can have about mm -hmm. China, because I think the Chinese model needs to be understood through this perspective as well. Because what I've argued in several articles I've written, one called is China turning Latin, uh, is that, uh, and I can send some of these if you want, uh, but actually Ch I think China is misread in terms of actually how it's much more vulnerable along these lines than it's typically made out to be in the typical Western discourse that presents it just as this emerging superpower. Um, but, uh, but nonetheless, China shows an example of a country that has has, you know, nonetheless facing these challenges through extremely strong state intentionality, uh, face the challenges and with a whole bunch of contradictions and problems, nonetheless, managed to grapple its way up, you know, the value chain and actually start to emerge with internationally competitive multinationals, right? Uh, which is the basis of their success. I mean, there's other problems with their success, but that's the basis of their success. Do other countries need to do the same in a more limited fashion? Yes. Uh, does this have 
problems and other aspects? Yes. I mean, but this is, I think, the world we have to face. It's the, it's the reality we need to face. How does finance support that? I would agree with the intention of a lot of these questions here. Should we reimpose capital controls? Yes. I'm, yeah, I was going to ask that because yeah, that's yeah. Related <laughs> there's to a lot the of excellent questions stories, here. Right? As soon as I look at them, I got completely distracted because they're so good. No, but please um, answer that one because it was on my list. So, uh, I mean, I think China and other examples you mentioned um, were also. Shall I, re shall I read it out loud so everyone yeah, knows can, what the question yeah. is? Okay. Um, shouldn't we advocate? to reintroduce capital controls. So the government could concentrate on industrial imports instead of consumptive imports. Yes, yeah. And not only capital controls, but also trade controls, right? I mean, uh, and this is the problem with liberalization, right? Is that liberalization is just basically people consume what they want. And then a lot of unnecessary consumption is, is a lot of the extra, the extra the, the, when you have a scarce foreign exchange and a lot of it is directed towards unnecessary consumption, especially if you have an unequal country and there's rich people doing a lot of luxury consumption, uh, which is completely unnecessary for the development of a the country, um, then uh, yes, these things should be controlled. Are we in a world where they will or can be controlled? You know, <laughs> and no, but, uh, but yes, ideally they should be controlled. Uh, same with uh, capital controls, yeah. Should should we be controlling speculative finance? Uh, yes, because I think a lot of this speculative portfolio flows now going into uh, government debt markets or or I mean the, you know the two main forms of government say African governments to finance themselves now of either issuing international bonds or opening up their local bond markets. Uh, and then the, the massive speculative flows of finance coming into this is completely distorting the local bond markets, right? And and also, the, and, and, you know, the celebration now is that the governments are issuing bonds in local currency. And so they've removed the exchange risk from the government. But that's only a short-term perspective because as soon as the government then has to refinance that debt, <laughs> they're faced with the higher interest rates. So it was only basically pushing off the higher interest rates into the future. And in any case, a lot of the private sectors in these countries are building up huge amounts of debt, which is in foreign exchange, not in domestic currency. And that's, um, uh, Yilma Zakius, for instance, writes about that and and how actually the, the building debt crisis that we're facing now is a lot in the private sector, not in the public sector, right? Um, yeah, yeah, so maybe... Yeah, and, and the, the, one, you know, the one example we can look to that has been trying to follow a different model in this sense is Ethiopia, right? Uh, but Ethiopia has been under enormous pressure in the last couple of years to basically abandon this model. Uh, but they've been, uh, they, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not too much of an expert, an expert on the country. I don't want to say, but, but there's other people who are, who are listening to me are far greater experts on this, but at least from my expertise on looking at the balance payments, it is fascinating to see actually that the story of Ethiopia trying to follow a different model is actually reflected Maybe we should single out that a bit more and, and also highlight it. I mean, as, yeah. as experts, as activists, you know, because there's always pointing to, you know, bad examples and maybe we don't champion the good examples enough. So I guess that's also uh, up yeah. to us, up to all the uh, attendees. So uh, with that, maybe I'd like to go to perhaps already the final question, but I hope not. So let's see how quick you are in answering, uh, Andrew. Yeah, yeah, it's I'll by uh, Netson Goma and uh, also a fan of your articles because uh, he writes in your article you say that these constraints on industrialization um, compounds specialization in primary commodities and how exactly would you explain this because this implies that industrialization itself hampers itself in a way yeah you know this is if uh, this is this is a good lead into the next talk by ingrid which you will, will you know will hope probably will be a great talk and the origins of dependency theory, what we call dependency theory, I mean, before the Marxists gotten heavily involved and the, the, some of the original expressions of dependence were from Celso Furtado and the group around him in, in, uh, in Prebish, in Sepal, the, the UNCTAD. Um, and he was writing about dependence in the 50s. Uh, and because what they were observing in Brazil, because Brazil was the most advanced industrial global south country or developing country or whatever term you wish to use at the time. Um, you know, it was the Brazilian miracle in the 60s and so on. Uh, and, and as Brazil came out of the post-war period in a fairly good situation and then started to intensively start to industrialize, it very quickly uh, uh, it sort of basically hit the wall and started to have balance of payments crises in the 50s, 
right? And, and, and that is partly what drove also to open up to foreign direct investment and so on. And with the problem, of course, of foreign direct investment is that it gives you a short-term boost, but then it sort of undermines you structurally in the long term in terms of exacerbating the outflows of, of foreign exchange through different very income accounts and service accounts and so on, right? So it brought it sort of up from about the mid 50s onwards, Brazil was going through this constant period of crisis up until the mid 60s when suddenly international lending was liberalized and it could then finance itself through commercial debt up until the end of the 70s. So the, the dependency theory really emerged out of that period of saying, it's not just an issue that Brazil was once exporting coffee, but even Brazil emerging in the post-war period as a significant industrial power uh, and industrializing very rapidly and somewhat successfully was hitting the wall in terms of these external constraints, which themselves were then creating the, 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 the necessity for further inflows of foreign direct investment and so on, which then laid the sort of laid the seeds for dependence or reinforcing dependence in the context of industrialization. So you had the original colonial dependence, you had the, the, in the dependence of the late 19th century commodity exporting, and then you had the dependence of import substitution industrialization. And the point is that import substitution industrialization, the, these early structuralists and dependency theorists, a lot of people blame them for import substitution industrialization. The reality is they were criticizing it. They were criticizing Latin American import substitution industrialization because it was riding off the heavy involvement of transnational corporations, largely US corporations, into strategic industrial sectors like car manufacturing and so on, right? Uh, so by the 90s, over 90% of car manufacturing in Brazil was basically foreign owned. Uh, and, and what they were arguing is that this was reinforcing dependence in the context of industrialization, right? So that's basically, a, a, I hope, not a short answer to your question, but I hope it, uh, I, I've, yeah, anyways, I, I could say much more on that. But, I, yeah, I think we are, we're definitely yeah. not done talking. Uh, yeah. We've only covered a very small part of all the issues, <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, unfortunately, it's already uh, five o'clock. Uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe Sarah, you would like to wrap up uh, in a minute. Did yeah, you, I, I just, um, yeah, I, I just would like one thing to say, and that is, yeah, you, you can def. I think that we can definitely see also a new age of dependency uh, uh, due to the quantitative easing. Uh, also mm -hmm. something we discussed in the previous series, uh, so much money being poured into global financial markets through central banks in, in, in the global north. Uh, and I think that this will be also a topic that we'll be discussing in other episodes in this series. But there's no time to discuss it now. Can I make uh, a, point, a very brief point on that, though? Quantitative easing, super brief. Quantitative easing is like the 70s on steroids, right? It's like... Okay. It's like and a lot of people blame the 70s on the oil crisis. It was not the oil crisis. It was the liberalization of banking in the 60s that drove the 70s. I've written about that and something I can send it if you wish. But it's the same thing now. It's like quantitative easing is not because of China. It's because of central bank policies in, in the, the rich countries, right? And that is, as you say, creating, like in the 70s, this big massive bubble, which is now potentially collapsing. I mean, the problem is we've been saying it will collapse anytime soon for the last five, six, seven years. And it just keeps going on. So, no. you know. No, We're just I, waiting I, until it does collapse yeah. at yeah. some point. Sarah, maybe you should uh, uh, wrap yeah. it up uh, and, because, and, and maybe we should meet up another time to yeah. continue yeah. this discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, Andrew, so you've shared a lot of uh, ideas and also you referred to some articles. Please send them to us and we'll yes. put them on the website. And I mean, I wish we... Could have stayed for another hour or longer because there's so much to be to be said and asked at least i have like also so many questions so sorry for for all the questions that couldn't be answered uh but i think you did manage to answer quite some actually because you you did manage in multitasking and, uh, and picking some up so thanks for that and thanks in general very much andrew for your great yeah. presentation wonderful uh, so to uh, Can you keep the audience, record of these questions, by the way. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll okay. uh, for okay. sure uh, uh, make a copy from of the chat, and then we can also uh, share it with you. Um, and for the rest, uh, to the attendees, I would like to say that there will be a recording also of this session on our website, uh, as well as the podcast version and the transcript. So if some things went too fast or you just want to reread them, just 
uh, check out our website. It will be online uh, next week. Um, and in two weeks' time, on the 22nd of October, we'll have another uh, episode of Crash Course. Uh, it will be featuring, uh, as already announced, Ingrid Harvold uh, Kwan Gragen. I hope I pronounced it correctly, uh, from the University of York. And she will discuss dependency theory, which was just now already introduced by Andrew. Uh, and then she'll try to explain the so-called underdevelopment as the result of a specific type of integration um, in the capitalist global economy that is uneven. And I guess maybe she might tell us something about the 70s or about the, the current uh, uneven uh, conditions also in the context of uh, monetary policy. If you're interested in hearing more about monetary policy, please check out our um, last series, which is also online. And then uh, very lastly, um, I'd just like to show you uh, where you can subscribe yourself to our newsletter. Uh, that's over here. So this is our website, our wonderful website built by Jeremy. And uh, here you can again find all the information uh, on Ingrid and on her talk. And you can subscribe by clicking on the sign up now button. So that's it for now. I think um, I'm wishing you all a very uh, happy afternoon or morning or evening, wherever you are. Um, and hope to see you next time. And I'd like to thank Andrew uh, so much again for all, all your great food for thought. I think mm. uh, we'll need some time to digest it all, I myself for sure. And uh, thanks again. Hope to see you in the future. Yeah, and thank you. goodbye, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.